Christian Church, how you doing? Good. Hey, it's, it's name tag Sunday. What's, what's happening? Like last service, I didn't... Oh, mine's over here. Sorry, that was weird. And so, name tag Sunday, and it's over here. Okay, so um, I, this, I was up here earlier, and then one of the ladies brought me one on stage. She's like, here you go. I was like, thank you. And so it was awesome. Um, so, so glad to be with you guys this morning. Um, I am from Nashville, Tennessee. I, I do want to uh, share with you a little bit of who my family is here in just a second, but I want to say something about your pastor um, and his wife and his family. Um, man, I've known them for, uh, man, 13 years, 14 years maybe, and I have gotten to see uh, the Lord do a massive work uh, through that family, in my own life specifically, but also just everywhere they go. Um, they're a type of group of people. They're not just, they don't just pass out pamphlets. They actually live it, okay? They're not passing out brochures. They live it. And you can even see by Montana and Mercy that are down here in the front, you see Montana, she is, she is her dad's energy 100%. And Mercy is her mama's consistency. And I think what's going to be so awesome when you guys get to know them more and really get to, to lean into this family, the great thing about it is, is you're going to learn a lot and some of you are going to teach them a lot, but you're going to learn a lot too. I've never met anyone um, that, that truly is, every time I've, I've, I've been with Blake and, and when I spent time with Blake, um, I've never seen someone um, more excited about life. I always say when I'm his age, because he's older than me, uh, when I'm his age, I want to live life for Jesus the way that he does. He's figured out a way to actually live life for Jesus in a way that, that never stops. And it's, it's been such a great honor to know him and for him to be a part of my life. And he's built a lot of things, but here's what you need to know. Every brick that he's built, the mortar in between is his wife. His wife is the most consistent woman that I've ever met. She has been a blessing. That whole family's been a blessing to my marriage and with me and my wife in a way that I could not express. Her kids have been a part of my student ministries growing up, and they believed in those student ministries more than I did it sometimes. They're just those type of people. When they come along and they walk through life with people, it just becomes healthy. And it's not because it's who they are, it's the Jesus in them that they listen to and respond to. And I can't wait to see, man, Jesus loves you all a lot to bring you this family. And I can't wait to see what God has in store for Heritage. Man, it's going to be so awesome. So I want to show you, this is a picture of my family um, right here. This is my wife, Ashley. She's down here. And we've been married for nine years. We just celebrated nine years like four days ago. And so it's awesome. We've been married for nine years. That's our four-year-old son, Valor. Valor, mighty men of Valor. What's up? Okay, it's manly. And so that's him. And he is all boy. Um, we, we, he comes into the house multiple times with spiders. And he'll say, Daddy, look, I caught a spider. It's got a squishy butt. Okay. And so uh, I, I'm not touching it. Put that down. You know. And so we have to have those conversations. And he's all boy. And then we have our, our other kid. We didn't know what to name him because if you have a son named Valor, you can't just name your next kid Bob. I mean, if your name's Bob, that's great, but I'm saying for my kids, I can't name the next kid Bob, which, hey, this is my, this is my brother Valor, what's your name? I'm Bob, okay? It doesn't work. And so we had to think of a name and, and like praying like, Lord, give it. We, we fasted about this, you know, because we really needed a name. And we came up with Oaks from Isaiah 61, Oaks of Righteousness, a display of a splendor. And so those are our two boys, and, and they are so much fun. They're so much fun. And so uh, that's a little bit of my family. We do live in Nashville, Tennessee. I run what's called the Teen Dream Center. We work with inner city kids. We teach, uh, we give them mentorship, discipleship, and purpose. We teach them job skills, professional skills classes. We, I know that Jesus can touch people personally. He can touch them uh, physically first but, and, and meet their physical needs even before he meets their spiritual needs. I don't care what order they come in. We just want them to happen. So that's what we get to do in Nashville, and it's awesome. And we have a coffee company, all kinds of stuff, but it's so fun that we get to do that in Nashville. We get to hang out with some inner city kids. And so today, I get the privilege to be here, and, and thank you guys for having me. You had no choice, okay? But I'm so glad that I get to be with you guys this morning, and we're going to jump in. Um, and we're going to jump into Philippians chapter 4. Um, before we do, though, let me, let me pray, and then we'll jump in. Um, Jesus, Father, I, I thank you so much that, that you are really good at knowing every heart in this room. I thank you that you personally know every heart in this room. And there are things today that we're going to speak on that every heart in this room needed. And it may be different things, but you have such a great way of your spirit just, just speaking to the heart of everybody that's here. 
So Jesus, I just pray that this morning w- would be that, 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 that this would be a thin place where heaven would come to earth in this room and that we would hear from the God that's not just in heaven but is personally invested in our lives and wants to walk out life with us, Jesus. Father, we don't want to be here and do this for you. We want to do this with you. And so, Jesus, we're here to do church with you. We want to know what you have to say because what you have to say is so important in our lives. And so, Jesus, today, would you continue to teach us and do things in us so that we can go out there and you can do things through us? So, Father, we thank you for this time that we get to spend in your word. And I pray, Father, that it would do what it does, that it would set people free. We love you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, in Philippians chapter 4, what, what it's broken up, it's a letter to the, the, uh, Philippi, it's a letter to the church, and, and, and he's writing this back to a specific church. And he's saying to them in, this, in, the, in the beginning of this, in chapter 4, how they've broken it up, is, is in the first half of Philippians 4, Paul is addressing an issue in the church that, that people are having an issue together, and he's teaching them how to work through it and asking them to work through it. And then as you get into the middle of Philippians, you see verses 4 through 9, he is then just an encouraging them because in this time and day, at this moment in time when he's writing this letter, Paul is in jail. He's been put in jail. He's being persecuted for calling Jesus who he is, that he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and they have put him in jail. And he is there in this time when he's writing this, and he in this time is also writing back to the people of Philippi, and he's writing to that church and encouraging them verses 4 through 9 of continuing the faith. Continue going. Continue, even in the persecution, even in the things that you're hearing about, even in the stuff that's swirling, all the stuff that's happening, just continue to run after Jesus, continue to do that. And then in the last half of it, he begins to just address to them how he's doing in jail. And he begins to talk about that time and how he is and where he is. And where I want to focus this morning is the middle of the pie. I want to focus right in the middle, verses 6 through 9. Because in this time, he's encouraging um, the, the believers. And I know that in, in Peachtree, Georgia, or wherever, I think, or I don't, I'm not sure where we are. We're in Georgia. Okay, let's just go with that. In Georgia, wherever we are right now, I know that we're not being um, persecuted. I know that it didn't, you didn't get persecuted to get here. You didn't, no, one, no one persecuted. But, but we all have things that we're walking through and we need encouragement about. And so we can learn from these scriptures what Paul is saying can totally be applied to our life. And I think there's some really great nuggets in these scriptures that we can take from. And so I open it in, in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 9. And I'm reading this out of the Amplified Version. I love how it's written. And it says this. It says, Do not be anxious or worry about anything. But in everything, in every circumstance and situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, continue to make your specific requests known to God. And the peace of God, that peace which assures the heart, that peace which transcends all understanding, that peace which stands guard over your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus is yours. Finally, believers, who whatever is lovely or whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever Uh, uh, and worthy of respect, whatever is right and confirmed by God's word, whatever is pure and wholesome, whatever is lovely and brings peace, whatever is admirable and of good repute, if there is any excellence, if there is any worth, anything worthy of praise, think continually on these things, center your mind on them, and plant them in your hearts. The things which you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things in daily life. And the God, who is the source of peace and well-being, will be with you. And so right here, he's encouraging the church. And in this moment, I think there's a few things that we can pull out, and even in in verse 6, it says, Do not be anxious or worried about anything. And right here in in this very first verse, in the first half of this, he, he's letting us know that there's another option besides worry and anxiousness. He's saying, do not worry. He's, he's actually saying to you that, that it doesn't have to be the case. And listen, Scripture never ever says something that we cannot do through Jesus. And so when he's saying these words, don't be anxious, don't worry about anything, he's telling us there's another option. And here's what I realized, is he's making a distinction He's letting us know that worry actually isn't prayer. A lot of times growing up, I thought worry was prayer. 
I don't know if that makes sense to you, but it makes sense to me because growing up, the way that my family began to show me that what love is, love was worry. Growing up, my, my mom loved us so much that she was the most worried person growing up that I knew. And so I thought that worrying about something was actually prayer, and it's not. He's making a distinction here. He's saying, don't worry about it, but in every circumstance and situation, pray. And it says, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, continue to make your specific request to God. And when he uses this word petition, what a petition is, or the petitions that I have seen, people will walk around sometimes with like, like little boards and they'll have you sign something as a petition towards something. And then what the people do, once they get enough signatures, they then take that petition and they give it to who? They give it to someone that's in power that can do something about it. Right? So when he's saying prayer and petition, he's saying, will you take the worry of your life? Will you take the things that you aren't big enough to handle and can't change anyway? And will you, will you give them over to the one that can, the one that's in power that can do something about it? And this is what we do with God. We hand it to him. And this is what he's asking us to do. This is what he's saying to us in this moment. And the best way that I can explain this is every night... Um, I put my son to bed, my four-year-old son, and every night we read three books, and I lay with him for two minutes, and then I tell him, you're the best. And then I go in the other room, and he has no idea what I do after that. Like, I'm dad. I get to do what I want. Once the kids are down, some of y'all know this, like, when the kids are down, it's like, yes, you know? And, and so, like, I go in the other room, and sometimes, you know what I do? Sometimes I eat Cinnamon Toast Crunch. I need to stop that, but sometimes I do. I'm just confessing right now. And then once I'm done eating Cinnamon Toast Crunch, you know what I do with the milk? I drink it, because it's great. And then, but, but you know what else I do sometimes? Because I'm dad, and when I put my son to bed and I tuck him into bed, you know what else I do sometimes? I pay the bills. And sometimes I pay the car payment, and sometimes I walk outside and I fix something that's broken. And sometimes I run to the store and I get food for the next day and the next morning so when he wants his yogurt. And can I just say to you, I don't care how old you are in this room or how young you are, you never outgrow being a child of God. And you may tuck kids in bed at nighttime, but did you know when you go to bed, there's a God that's tucking you into bed and he's your father, and when he tucks you into bed, he's going to go downstairs and he's going to pay the bills. He's going to take care of everything while you sleep and you have no idea what he's doing behind the scenes. He's a really good father. He's a much better father than me. And he's going to go downstairs and he's going to take care of everything. And everything that's been on your mind, he knows and he knows you intimately. And he's going to take care of everything in this church and he's going to take care of everything in your personal life. And some of you have been waiting. You just need to know God's going to do it because he's a good God and he's a really big God and he knows what he's doing. So we just give it to him. Here, God, take this. I'm going to go to sleep. Tuck me in. And I'm going to be me, God, and you be you. Can we just right-size us this morning? Can we right-size how small we are and how big he is? Can we just right-size and look to him and say, Jesus, I just know you're a good father and I don't need to be anxious and I don't need to be worried that you're a God that'll tuck me in and you'll go take care of business. I can't, but you didn't ask me to. I never graduate from being your child. I don't care how important you are in your world. You always have a father that's got your back. Give it over to him. He can do something with it when we can and so as we do that, and as we move forward, and after we allow God to have those things, and we make our, our requests specific to him, and we give them over to him, it says, and the, then after that, and the peace of God, the peace which uh, assures that the heart, that peace which transcends all understanding, that peace which guards, uh, that stands guard over your heart and mind in Christ Jesus is yours. It's not that it wasn't yours. It's just you got your focus on off of this and onto this. That peace has always been there for you. If you know Jesus, you have the fruits of the Spirit living in you. You don't have to ask God for them. They're already there. Peace already lives in you. It's living inside your heart. It came with the Holy Spirit when you received him. You don't have to ask him for it. 
It already lives inside you. It was the package deal, batteries included. It's awesome. They're there. You don't have to now go, oh man, it's the worst when you, when you bring a, 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 my son's like, gifts home or like, like something that runs on batteries and we, get it, we pull it out and we're so excited to use it and then we realize we don't have any batteries. Well, Jesus came with all the batteries. You have everything you need. He placed it there. It's there for you. And that is yours. The peace in your mind that guards your heart is yours. And then he goes on to read in, 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 in verse 8. It says, after this, he tells us what to do with our worries, what to do with our anxiety, what to do with our fear. Give it over to God, the one who can do something about it. And he tells us when we do that, then now all of that peace is ours. We, we receive that it will guard our hearts. And then he begins to tell us now what to do. And then he says, finally, believers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable and worthy of respect, whatever is right and confirmed by God's word, whatever is pure and wholesome, whatever is lovely and brings peace, whatever is admirable and good, a good repute, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think on these things, center them in your mind, center them Center your mind on them and implant them in your heart. He's now giving us an option now after we give it over to God that now we, we've got an empty space here that worry, anxiety, and fear once held. And now he needs to replace it with something else. And so now he's shown us how to renew our mind, how to empty ourselves of worry, fear, doubt, all this other stuff, and now we've got to replace it. And so this is what he's shown us how to do. This is what we do. We, we think on whatever is true, whatever is right and confirmed by God's word. He's telling us what to do here. And Paul knew, Paul knew that if we give something over to God, if we hand it over, that there is a, a vacancy in our mind that it must be filled with something or that worry, anxiety, and fear will come back. You know you can't pull in a parking spot where there's another car? That's called a wreck. So it's now unoccupied, and now we need to occupy it so that nothing else can pull in there. And that's what he's saying here. Empty it. Now fill it. Fill it with the word of God. Fill it with the truth because your opinion won't set you free. Your past won't set you free. The things that have come from your past, none of those things that your mama said, your daddy said, the things that you knew growing up said will set you free. It is the truth that will set you free. And if you can get the truth in you, you'll live a free life. Empty, refill. Empty, refill. And Paul knew this. Because he knew that whatever we think on eventually will walk out. He knew that whatever we believe is a truth, even if it's not true, will walk it out. He knew this. And the best way that I can explain this is, is um, back when me and my wife, um, we, we were married, but we didn't have kids. Man, we, we had energy. <laughs> Some of you are like, yes. And so we had energy. And so we used to go to these midnight showings of movies that would just come out, and someone told us when I was a student pastor that I needed to go see this certain movie, and I needed to go to the, the, the opening show because people are crazy, they dress up and all this stuff, and they go get in line, and it's nuts, and I said, okay, I'll go, and so me and my wife, we went, and we got in this, there was a huge line, and, and they were right, people were dressed up, they were dressed up, and it was this movie called Harry Potter, and, and they had the little lightning bolt in their forehead and the glasses, you know, and the little wand, you know, whatever. And so they had this, you know, whatever. And so they're there and they're all ready. They're ready. They're like, Come on, let's go, get in there. And so they all run in and, and before the movie even shows, like people are like, like battling it out with their little sticks, you know, you know, and, and it's like awesome. And then the credits roll and they're, they're just like, they're all excited. And there's a lady behind me. She's dressed in all the stuff. She's got all the lightning bolt and all the stuff. And she's sitting behind me and she's got her, you know, her little wand and her drink, you know, <laughs> you know, just watching. And there comes a point in the movie, spoiler alert, where Harry Potter dies. And the lady behind me, she's losing her mind. She's going, <gasps> she's doing the ugly cry, like the ugly cry. And, 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 and I'm just kind of like, huh, what's your wand going to do for you now? Okay, and, so, and so, you know, she's there, and, and she's like, I'm going to be single the rest of my life. My love has died, you know, and she's there. And, and, and all of a sudden, I just had this thought. I thought, surely she knows that. Surely she's read the book. Surely she knows that Harry Potter's not dead yet. Surely she didn't come and dress in all this stuff and, and, and like, but she hadn't read the book. Surely she's read the book. Surely she knows that it's not over. Like Harry Potter's not dead. And the reason I tell you that is because isn't that so true about our life? That we can know a truth. 
But sometimes the emotion of the moment trumps the truth that we know. Isn't that true? How many times in my life have I thought, it's ending, everything's done, you know, and then all of a sudden then I'm like, two weeks later, what happened? I don't know, it's, everything's great, awesome. You know, like, that's me, like, that's where I've lived so much of my life. It's not that it's not true. It's just, if you and I believe a lie as a truth, it will begin to affect our life as if it's true. Let me say it again. If you and I believe a lie as a truth, it will begin to affect our life as if it's true. None of us can get away from that. And worry's a lie. Anxiety's a lie. Fear's a lie. That's what it is. And so the best way that I know to kind of share with you and, and, and talk about where lies come from and where we can renew our minds, because when Paul's saying that, he wants us to replace something else. When we release something, replace something with the new and renew our minds, the best way I know to go back to is the very first man and woman in the Bible. Because if we can go back to their life and we can know before Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve in the garden, there was no sin, no worry, no anxiety, no fear. There was nothing in the garden that was disconnecting them from God. God sit with him in the cool of the day. He made them to be with him. There's no sin, nothing. is just he made all the plants and the animals and the vegetation and all this stuff for them. And he placed man and woman in the garden. And, and there was nothing there that was, that was hindering their relationship with him. There was nothing being said from their mouths or thoughts in their heads or coming from God's mouth that had anything to do with worry, anxiety, fear. None. And then Genesis 3 happens. This is the first time that a voice in the garden began to speak something contrary to God's thoughts. And this is how it happens for you and me. So Genesis chapter 3, verses 1, it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say, really say, You must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the tree in the garden, but God did say, We must not eat fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Then the woman, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and she ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized that they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together. And they covered themselves. And right here, Adam and Eve in the garden. When the serpent came in the garden, those thoughts were not her thoughts. He, the serpent spoke thoughts to her. He threw thoughts at her. They were not her thoughts. They became her thoughts when she took them. She put them in her pockets. She, she didn't have pockets. Uh, she didn't have clothes. And so she, when she took them in, and then she walked them out. The serpent in this moment, in, in Genesis chapter 3, he didn't wrap himself around her and go, you're going to eat from the tree that I tell you because I'm... He didn't do any of that. All he did was speak thoughts to her that were contrary to God's thoughts, and then when she took them in and she believed them, then she walked them out. And the same thing is true for you and I. That not every thought that comes into your head is yours. Not every thought, just because you had the thought doesn't make it yours. It becomes yours when you plant and you walk it out. And that's why Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But if you are not hearing the word of God, whatever you are hearing, eventually you're going to walk out. That's just true. And that's what happens. And I remember thinking back, I remember the very first lie that I ever believed. And it happened in first grade, and it was this right here. This picture. So uh, that's my first grade picture, and um, that's a mullet. That's just not any mullet, that's a perm mullet. Okay? So the first lie I ever believed is that, <laughs> that perm mullets were cool. But I do remember the very first lie that really had an effect on me, which I didn't have a girl, I never got a girlfriend with that, I'm sure. But, but the, 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 the real big lie that really affected me in first grade, I remember being up on the board, and I remember writing something. And I don't even remember what I was doing. I don't remember what we were doing. There was something on the board. And I remember walking away. Someone laughed. And all of a sudden, I remember walking back to my seat, and I felt like I was dumb. And in first grade, I began to say these words, I'm dumb. I'm dumb. I'm dumb. I began to play in my head. And from the third grade, I was in these reading disability classes from the third grade to the eighth grade. 
all because I begin to believe a lie. And here's the crazy thing. When you and I begin to believe lies, when we have space occupied by lies in our heads, you can remember everything that happened. Like for me, I can tell you everything. In first grade, I can tell you what the room looked like. I can tell you what the room smelled like. I can tell you where the board was. I can tell you that the seat that I sat in. I can remember everything about that moment going all the way back to first grade because in this moment, before I ever knew that an enemy existed, he wanted to place something in my brain that was not God's thought and get me to remember that all the way until my age today at 36. And the same thing is true for you. So not every thought that comes in your head is yours. So we have to take inventory of the things that are coming in, let certain things out, and replace them with God's truth, like what Paul's talking about here in Romans. I mean, in, in Philippians. Now, every thought is yours. And the best way that I can, like, explain the whole idea of, of these thoughts that come in and what they do to us, like, you believing a lie as a truth will begin to affect you. Is how many of you guys love The Lion King? Anyone love The Lion King? Oh, my goodness. How many of you guys have seen the musical? Anyone seen the musical? Oh, it's the best. If you haven't, go out and get tickets today. Okay, seriously. Take your wife to New York. I've never been there to see it. But I did see it a couple years ago, the musical. And it's amazing. The opening scene, there's like all these people wearing spandex and colors, and there are these animals, and, ah, and then their bodies are moving like they shouldn't, and it's, it's, it's awesome. And then, and then there's that moment where he's, oh, you know, that whole thing. And, and it's awesome, and the curtains close, and I'm like standing up like, one more time. One. My wife's like, sit down, okay? And so, like, it's amazing. And then, as you watch, there's a moment that you guys know if you've seen um, even, the, even the cartoon, whatever you, you know, but in the musical, there's a moment, and I've never seen this. I don't know if it even is in the cartoon, but I, I saw it in the musical, and there's a moment where, where Simba runs away because of Scar lying to him. And he runs far, far away, right? He goes way, way away. And then all of a sudden, Rafiki, remember, Rafiki comes to him, and like in the musical, she's like this. If you haven't seen it, this is weird. And so Rafiki comes, and, and Rafiki says, and he's run away. He's isolated himself. He's gone far away. It's, and, and, and Rafiki comes and says, Simba, your father's not dead. He's alive. So we remember this. And he says, no, my father's dead. He says, no, Simba, he lives in you, okay? And it's like awesome. And in this musical, there's this moment right here. I... I I got to read you. It breaks into this song. And I don't remember this in, in, in the, the, uh, the animation, but I, I, I saw this in, in, the, um, in the musical. And I got to read you these words because I, I'm having this moment with Jesus. And this is what it says. It says, wait, there is no mountain too great. Hear the words and have faith, have faith. He lives in you. He lives in me. He watches over everything we see into the waters, into the truth. In your reflection, he lives in you. This is in the musical. He says, he lives in you, he lives in me. He watches over everything we see into the waters, into the truth. In your reflection, he lives in you. And in this moment, I'm having a moment with Jesus that I can't explain. I'm doing the ugly cry like the Harry Potter girl. Like I'm like, oh, Jesus, he loves me, he lives in me. It's awesome. And I tell you that because the lie was that his father wasn't with him. But his father was with him the whole time. And a lot of times what anxiety and worry will tell us is that our father's not with us. And last time I checked, your father's with you. Last time I checked, if you said yes to Jesus, he made his home in you. Last time I checked, he didn't go anywhere. He doesn't check out like the seventh grade girlfriend that broke up with you. He doesn't do that. He lives in you. Okay, he's there. And so anything that is shame, fear, condemnation, it is not from God. He did not give you a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. That's what he's given you, a sound mind. It is yours for the taking. He has put it on the table. He has said to you, you can have this. Here's the buffet. It is all there. All the fruits of the spirit are yours to partake at any moment, at any time. You don't have to ask me for them. They live in you the moment that you receive me. I don't know for you what lies you've been believing that are producing fear and anxiety and worry. Just be a good time for us to take inventory of what's going on in our head. And for some of us, it may just be that we just feel like the other shoe's just always going to drop because it always does. Yeah, we have a good time and a good 
but, but the rough patch is coming. Or maybe for you, it's, it's that you just don't feel lovable. Or maybe for you, you've been hanging on to that thing, it's that addiction thing, and, and you wish you could be free, and you've, you've done this before, and, and you haven't seen any breakthrough, and you're, you're at this point where you're just kind of given up, and you just said, what's the point? Or maybe for you, it's that you don't believe that God can ever forgive you. There was a line that you knew that you couldn't cross, and you crossed the line, and, and that happened, and because you crossed the line, that you, you've gone too far, and that you're too far gone. Can I just tell you, you're not too far gone? Maybe for some of you, it's just been so long that you just feel like it's always going to be that way. Can I just tell you, maybe it's not. Maybe it's not. The thing that I love is when we learn about new truths, it kind of takes a while to get used to them. It's kind of like a new pair of pants. If you get a new style of pants at first, you put them on, you're like, I don't think these are me. You guys are looking at my pants right now. Are these me? Anyway, so they're new. Um, but, but when I think about it, it takes a while to put on these pants and wear them with confidence. <laughs> it's a funny thought. And, but it's true, even for the truths. Like God begins to tell you new things and give you new understanding and give you new truth about who you are. And sometimes it just takes us a while to live out that new truth and to believe it that it's really you. And the best way I can explain this is in, in, in 1865, they, they passed the 13th Amendment to abolish slavery. And there's a moment where the slave owners had to go out to the fields and look the slaves in the eyes and say to them, you are free, you are not owned anymore. They'd walk out to the fields and tell the slaves, you are free, you don't have to live here anymore, you can walk off this land and never be owned again. You don't, we don't own you, no one owns you anymore. And you know what a lot of them did? They stayed. It wasn't that the truth wasn't true. It wasn't that through our government that they had not freed these men from being owned anymore. It was just they lived in the presence of something for so long they begin to think that it's the reality when the reality had changed. And can I just tell you there's been a reality shift. There's been a change. You are not owned anymore. Romans tells us in Romans 6, 17 and 18 that you were once a slave to sin, but now you're a slave to righteousness. There used to be a ball and chain on your leg that you could not get off, and it was sin. You could not defeat it. You could not overcome it. You had no power against it. It had power over you and it owned you. But it said, when you receive Jesus, now he changes that ball of sin and shame that is on your leg to a ball and chain of righteousness that you have no key to remove. It is fully yours to walk in. And there is a lavish world and a lavish field to run in and to live free in a way that you never have before. Push out the walls. There is no box anymore. Go run after Jesus because he has freed you. If the Son has set you free for your free indeed. It is why he came to die on a cross for you and I. He didn't come just to get you a ticket to heaven. Yes, he did that and that would be enough, but he came to make you alive. Alive. Church, for a lot of us, we're just taking the ticket and saying someday we'll be there. And that's great. I can't wait for heaven. But I want everything that he has for me on this side of heaven. I want to see how free one man and one woman can be on this side of heaven. Because if it is freedom that he set us free for, I want all of it. And church, we can have it. We can have it. And in Philippians 4.13, you know the verse. It says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And the truth is, is either that is true or it's not at all. It's either you can do all things that is before you through, the, through Jesus that gives you strength, or you can't. And you just need to know it's true. And so here's what I want to do to close out this message. Um, because a lot of us in that, we go, okay, we kind of get it. Like, I get it, I, I need to put that on Jesus, I need to replace and, and renew my mind. I want to I show you what happened when you gave your life to Jesus. So I'm going to call up, I have a couple of volunteers that are going to help me real quick in this time. I should have called you up a little earlier, I'm sorry. Um, but come on up if you would. Um, but I want to teach you what, what happened uh, the moment that you gave your life to Jesus because I think in this it'll help you see what you've been given um, and, and what we can live in um, as these volunteers come. Thank you so much. 
You guys will just stand right here for me. That'd be great. Perfect. You can face them. Perfect. Thank you. Great. You look great. So, so the Bible tells us this. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, it says, when we come into this world, we have a body. Hi, Jeff. We have a soul. We have a spirit. Okay? All of us. You, didn't, you weren't burdened in this world and the doctor looking at you and go, oh, sorry, I don't have a soul. Put it back in, right? Like, it didn't happen that way, okay? All of us have a body, soul, and a spirit. Thank you, Ketrick. And so that's what you've been given. And, and, and so the body is what you move around in. It's what you guys do push-ups for. It's the outside appearance. What you ladies put that bat poop on. Maybe it's Maybelline. It's that kind of stuff, right? Like, you, you get it. You get it. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for, <laughs> thank you. That was better than I thought for you two. Let's hang out after. Um, tell some more jokes. And so... So your body is the outside appearance, okay? Thanks, great. And then your soul, your soul, everyone say this, your soul is made up of your mind, will, emotions. That's your soul. And then you have your spirit. Well, the Bible tells us that when we come into a relationship with Jesus, our spirit and the Holy Spirit become one. This is 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, you're in Christ. You're a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. This is the new you. This is the pure you. This new spirit that Jesus placed in you is pure, righteous, holy, and complete. It can't get any newer. It can't get dirty again. You can't do anything to make this thing leave. He's made his home in you. It is there. He lives in you. So everything that was in Jesus, the same exact spirit that raised Jesus from dead, not breathing, in a tomb that rolled the, 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 the stone away, that same spirit lives in every single one of you that have said yes to Jesus and made him your Savior and Lord. Well, man, if that's it, then why do I still struggle with anxiety and worry and fear? Why do I still struggle through sin and different things? Well, the problem's not this. You've been given all of this. The problem is our soul, not you. Okay, our soul. And the Bible tells us, how do we renew our mind to know the will of God? Romans 12, 2 says, be ye transformed by the renewing of our mind. And so if you can get the truth into your soul, it will begin to line up with your new spirit and your body will follow. It is not your opinions that will, will renew the soul. It is not your past that will renew the soul. It is his truth. And when you renew your mind through his truth, it will begin to line up with your spirit and your body will follow. That's the renewal process. That's what Paul's saying. Why do we think on things that are lovely, that are true, that are, that are by God's word? We do it because it's renewing our soul so it'll line up with the new us. Can you guys give it up for these guys? Thank you so much. Thank you. And so you just need to know that you have all the Jesus you're ever gonna need to face anything that you're facing today. He placed all of his spirit in you. You're not going to get more tomorrow. He put all of his spirit in you. It's all there. What we're not doing is trying to chase God and get more of him. What we're doing is renewing our mind so what's in us will flow from us. That's a new concept for some of you in the room today. It was a new concept for me, but when I understood that I had all of him, I then knew that I could access him by renewing my mind. And the best way I can explain this, and I'll close with this, is this. My very first car was a 1986 Buick Somerset limited edition. It was my grandma's car. I paid $1,200 for it. She smoked those Virginia Slim cigarettes, the ones that are like really long and someone else has to light. Some of you get it. And so she smoked it so much that the top of the lining came down in the car and it was kind of hitting you when you roll the windows down. It's not really cool looking when you're like, hey girl, how you doing? And so I pinned them up. So when you lay back, it looked like stars. Hey, okay. It was awesome. I didn't know how to make this car any cooler. I didn't know what to do, but I went to Walmart. And I got a Sony CD player. I went and bought that Sony CD player in that kit. Some of you know, you've done this before. And we wired up that Sony CD player. And I, hit, I, I, turned, I turned the ignition. And all of a sudden, that CD player started blinking. It was on. I was like, oh, I'm going to get a girlfriend. But there was a few things in the CD player that I, I didn't know how to work. I didn't know how to set the clock, and I didn't know how to set the stations at the bottom. Some of you guys know we used to have these things called CDs. You put them in a car. Anyway, we'll talk about it later. But, but, but with, with this, I didn't know how to set the stereo. I didn't know how to set the, the clock and, 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 the, and the other stuff. And there's other things I didn't know how to work in it. It wasn't that I needed to go back to Walmart and say to them, hey, I'm missing parts. Hey, I'm missing some parts. I need to figure this out. It's, it's not working. What I needed to do is to go to the manual of the ones who made it. Because if I went to the manual of the ones who made it, they would tell me how it's to function and how it's meant to work. And the same thing is true for you. God left us a manual. 
When you receive the Spirit of God, it's a big God. It's a big Spirit. There's a lot about God that you don't understand and that I don't understand. But if we can get into the manual of the one who made us and knows everything about us, it will begin to transform us and we will function exactly the way that he meant us to function on this side of heaven. You have all the Jesus you're ever going to need to face whatever's in front of you. Tonight, let him tuck you in and let him go pay the bills. Don't worry. He's got you. He's really good at this thing called life. And if he was faithful in the past, he'll be faithful today and tomorrow. There's a great verse that says he gives sleep to those he loves. And I pray that tonight you sleep better than you ever have. So let me pray for you.